thank you. Uh, welcome to Atlanta. I've got a lot of complications to cover in 15 minutes, so I guarantee I'm going to be moving faster than traffic is at this time of day in Atlanta. So I have no relevant disclosures for this talk. When we talk about aortic valve surgery, what we're really talking about is aortic valve replacement as it has become the choice for, for correction of aortic valve disorders. And one of the reasons is that non-operative management really equates to a poor survival. If you have new onset of severe aortic stenosis with, sim with symptoms, you have a three-year survival of about 25% or less. And also, our surgeons have gotten much better at valve replacement. Mechanical valves have lifespans up to 30 years now, and the low perioperative mor mortality that's been reported, and then these really 3% complication rate per year with, with replaced valves is where we're gonna come into play as imagers. There are several types of valves, mechanical valves, bioprosthetic valves, and the general trend has been towards least, the least invasive method po possible, which has culminated with the transcatheter valve that's been previously covered. So you know, there's a boatload of complications, and I like to clump things into different categories. Here's how I look at this with the aortic valve complications, that you have several different groups. Infection is certainly a large category. Uh, endocarditis, perivalvular abscesses, and there's overlap with other categories. It can lead to dehiscence, it can lead to pseudoaneurysm, but you can also have this just from surgical breakdown at the suture lines themselves. Structure, structural failure, where we are really dealing with the leaflets themselves, whether they degenerate or fracture. And then finally, there's a category that we're not really going to cover, which is systemic manifestations, embolization, bleeding from anticoagulation, hemolysis related to the valve. That's really more for the clinicians. In terms of imaging, CT, at least in my practice, is much more common than MR. While ECG gating is nice, if you know you're going to encounter one of these, it's not necessary, as I will show you in several of these cases where the diagnosis can be made on non-gated CTs. So when I'm reviewing these cases with our surgeons or when I'm going over them with my residents, I like to preach an approach. Here's one that I, I use in these cases, really four questions to ask. And it's important to know what the original indication was. I think this gets into some of what Dr. Hope was saying with just aortic surgery, because oftentimes you see a valve, plus you see an aorta being replaced as well. If it's a bicuspid valve with an aortopathy, is this a redo valve? And similarly, what's the acuity? I think in general, that we've encountered more complications in patients that undergo emergent repair, be it for dissection with hemopericardium, the get in, get out, save the patient, or patients with endocarditis, rather than these elective surgeries. The surgical technique is also going to be important, again, emphasizing know where your suture lines are. And then finally, what are their current symptoms? Obviously, this is going to lead you to a specific differential or diagnosis based on the symptomatology. So start off with a relatively straightforward case. This is a patient who was five years post-op from a, pro a bioprosthetic aortic valve. This is a reduced sternotomy that we did, non-gated study. And what, the first thing you notice, this is a non-gated study. You see motion even in the, the chambers, but the valve leaflets are relatively fixed. So you can infer that they're not really moving that well because we're getting a good image of these valves. They're also markedly thickened, and you can see calcification in the valve leaflet, which is certainly abnormal. So this is a case of structural failure from degeneration. This is something that is seen with bioprosthetic valves, more from xenografts than homographs. And companies are getting better with different fixation processes to reduce this complication in newer models of valves. You can also see tear or rupture of the, the valve leaflets. And in general, we see this failure of bioprosthetic valves less in patients that are over 65 years old. And one of the theories is that these patients are less active and there's less stress on the valves. It's rare with mechanical valves. And of course, the classic example is the bjork shiley valve, which was a tilting disc valve with a strut. These struts would fracture, as in this case, you can faintly see here that this is the disc that's, uh, that has been dislodged and can embolize. The patient presented in florid heart failure. Here you see this is the disc as it's fractured. So as of 10 years ago, there were still 22,000 of these patients in the United States. So there's still several thousand floating around. You may encounter one. But in general, it's a very low complication rate even for this valve. But with other mechanical valves, this almost doesn't happen anymore. What you see more commonly with mechanical valves is going to be panis or thrombus. This is a patient that presented after having an echocardiogram that showed increased velocities. We see decreased excursion of the posterior leaflet, and you can see the subtle little filling defect along the ring of the valve. 
Now, there have been findings that can be described with panis versus thrombus. In general, though, I think that, and I think that our clinicians believe that the clinical history, the acuity of the symptoms, this is more of gradual onset, the time since the implementation, this was several years after valve implantation, and also anticoagulation, if a patient comes in with a low INR, acute symptoms, then you start thinking thrombus. Here's just an example of a normal valve. You see almost parallel excursion of both of the leaflets. Moving on to another case, this is another bioprosthetic aortic valve two years prior, and the patient presents with fever. We again see leaflet thickening. However, this time we see it's eccentric and asymmetric thickening, kind of between the right and the left coronary cusps. You may be able to hallucinate that there's a nodule on the, on the ventricular side. I think this is just more leaflet thickening. But this is really just endocarditis until proven otherwise. Endocarditis can affect bioprosthetic or mechanical valves. Within the first couple of months, you usually see staph aureus, epidermidis, con uh, contamination from a prior abscess, skin contamination. And then later, it's more of a natural history like you would see with native valve endocarditis. With bioprosthetic valves, it's usually limited to the leaflets. And then with mechanical valves is where you start to see extension into the paravalvular tissues, abscess, breakdown, dehiscence, pseudoaneurysm. And in general, a good rule of thumb is fever is endocarditis in these patients until proven otherwise. As seen in this case, this patient was transferred for a negative transesophageal echocardiogram despite fever and bacteremia. Here we see on our gated CTA, there's clearly a nodule. This one you can clearly see is on the ventricular side, more common for, for vegetations. And so this was another case of endocarditis. And it's been reported that CT can be up to 97% sensitive for detection of endocarditis. Another patient with infection, not a endocarditis, but this is a patient that had a valve and an ascending repair for dissection. And here we see this rind of, of phlegmon, this intermediate attenuation fluid around the aorta. And our surgeons really like this study. This patient was evaluated with, with echo first, showed a possible fluid collection. They like the CT. It shows them the full extent of the abnormality. It shows them if there's a pseudoaneurysm. It shows them if it, the, the coronary ostea are involved in this case. So this is a paravalvular abscess. Um, which he was treated with antibiotics for several months before he went for, for re-repair. So this can be subtle, as Dr. Hope was saying. You, know, you need to know the normal appearance of graft material. This is way too thick. This patient may be encountered on a PE protocol study in the ED when they haven't properly assessed the risk factors or, or what's going on with the patient. Another patient with infection, they had seven months prior a valve replacement for endocarditis. Here we don't see a paravalvular abscess, but what we do see are these multiple complex pockets of contrast that communicate with the aortic lumen. So this is several. There were at least two or three different, uh, different pseudoaneurysms as a result of infection causing breakdown of the tissue near the, the suture line. Now here's a, a pitfall. This is a patient that was actually transferred into our, into our department with question of a pseudoaneurysm because they saw this asymmetric bulge near the aortic root on the axial images. This is to emphasize, always do MPRs. Look at this on a 3D workstation. When you reconstruct, you see the valve is nicely seated. These are the patient's native sinuses of Alsalva that were dilated. This is not a pseudoaneurysm. This was just a fake out. Similarly, getting back to the combined aortic valve and aorta repair, this is a patient that had had an ascending repair with a valve and they were transferred in for what was billed as a recurrent dissection. We know this is not a dissection as the patient doesn't have an ascending aorta to dissect. They have a graft. And we see this is a huge collection of contrast that emanates from the aortic root extending up into the ascending aorta along the graft. So this is a large pseudoaneurysm. And this was a result of a dehiscence. So the valve was sewed in at the root, and you can see the valve has separated. Now there's a finding that was described on radiographs where if you saw a change in angulation of a valve, which you could imagine if this was a, a mechanical valve, you could see that it should be at about this angle. And greater than 6% was reported as a, as a suggestive of a dehiscence. In this case, this was 75% of the valve that had separated and caused this large pseudoaneurysm along the ascending aorta. Also important, dehiscence can occur at any anastomosis. This is why we stress or always know what surgery has been done. Here's a patient that came in with a pseudoaneurysm. This was an outside CT. The surgeons took the patient to the OR thinking that the dehiscence was actually at the distal graft, 
And it wasn't until about an hour in when they asked us to look at the images and see where is this coming from. And what you can notice on the axial images was this little horizontal little ditzel. And then when you do a recon, you see it's actually coming from the left coronary button. So this was a fistula, or this was a dehiscence of the button with a little bit of a negative contrast jet. So this was the site confirmed at surgery where the de dehiscence was. So again, knowing where all of the suture lines are can really help make a difference with your surgeons. Here's a patient that has communication between the LV outflow tract and another tube. This happens to be the actual aorta, not a pseudoaneurysm. So this is a paravalvular leak. This is a patient that was about 13 years post his third aortic valve replacement for congenital aortic stenosis. He now had dyspnea on any exertion and hemolysis. So, so paravalvular leaks, we see continuity between the LV outflow tract and between the ascending aorta. You can see this from infection. You can see it from improper sizing or implantation of the valve. Perhaps this patient continued to grow and was undersized. But the key is the continuity here. On MR, we may see an eccentric dephasing or flow jet as well. He was actually treated percutaneously with two amplats or plugs that they put in, significantly reduced his paravalvular leak and improved his symptoms. Another patient, moving on to the more, the, the in vogue transcatheter aortic valves, a common complication we see is the paravalvular leak. Here's a, an MR shortly after the procedure was performed, a patient who has this large eccentric flow jet. You can see it hitting the lateral wall of the, mitral, or of the left ventricle during diastole. We estimated on phase contrast imaging about a 35% uh, regurgitant fraction. And they did a valve and valve repair to help close that off. And you can see the, subjectively the jet is less. On the follow-up study, the regurgitant fraction has decreased to less than 20%, mild in this case. And on his pre-op, he just had a non-contrast CT. You can see this chunky calcification along the mitral aortic curtain, which predisposed to this eccentric, uh, this eccentric paravalvular leak. Uh, the undersizing of the valves, malpositioning, this calcification are all risk factors. And what we have seen, though, is improved valve sizing with CTA, as Dr. Beerhalls referred to earlier. Another case, hopefully this one's a, a crowd pleaser, you see one transcatheter aortic valve, you see a second transcatheter aortic valve in the aortic arch. This is a patient during placement, they induce a tachyarrhythmia. The patient had a couple of ectopic beats which ejected this up their catheter, you can see right at the end of the cycle. And so actually, we did a CT afterwards, I don't show it here. It was situated between the great vessels, wasn't causing any, any complications. But what's interesting is this was also complicated by paravalvular leak. So this patient received a third transcatheter aortic valve. Uh, and I'll end with this. This is probably one of Atlanta's largest dissections. This is just a reminder that aortic valve replacement can be an independent risk factor for type A dissection. So again, knowing the history, this was probably a patient that had a bicuspid valve. He was done several years prior at an outside hospital lost to follow up except for his anticoagulation. I say probably, he probably had a bicuspid aortopathy, then has more of a chronic appearing type A dissection. You can see how thick this, this intimal flap is. Uh, but th this, is an, uh, this is a risk factor. So again, when patients come in with chest pain, it's certainly something to think about. So uh, thank you for your attention.